All right. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters for today, Douglas Fisher and Nancy Fry. Douglas Fisher is professor and chair of educational leadership at San Diego State University and a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. Previously, Doug was an early intervention teacher and elementary school educator. He is the recipient of an International Reading Association, William S. Gray Citation of Merit, and an Exemplary Leader Award from the Conference on English Leadership of NCTE, as well as a Krista McAuliffe Award for Excellence in Teacher Education. In 2022, he was inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame by the Literacy Research Association. He has published numerous articles on reading and literacy, differentiated instruction, and curriculum design, as well as books such as PLC Plus, Visible Learning for Literacy, Comprehension, the Skill, Will, and Thrill of Reading, How Feedback Works, Teaching Reading, Teaching Students to Drive Their Learning, and Welcome to Teaching. Doug loves being an educator and hopes to share that passion with others. Thanks so much, Doug, for being with us. And next, it's my pleasure to introduce Nancy Fry. Nancy Fry is a professor in educational leadership at San Diego State University and a member of the International Literacy Association's Literary Research Panel. Nancy has published in The Reading Teacher, Theory into Practice, Reading Psychology, Early Childhood Education Journal, and Educational Leadership on research related to literacy, school leadership, and effective instruction. Her current books include The Teaching Reading Playbook, Teaching Students to Drive Their Learning, Welcome to Teaching, and the PLC Plus suite of books. In 2008, she was given the Early Career Achievement Award by the Literacy Research Association and is a member of the California Reading Hall of Fame. She's a credentialed special educator, reading specialist, and administrator in California, and is a co-founder and administrator at Health Sciences High and Middle College. Thank you so much, Nancy, for being with us today. And I will turn it over to both of you. Awesome, thank you, Megan. And Nancy, you know, I was thinking about this as we prepared today, we were both new teachers at one point. So, yes, we were. And I was a new teacher when dirt was invented. So it's been a while. <laughs> and we uh, had mentoring as new teachers and we have mentored new teachers. So I've been thinking about this a lot about how important it is to provide support to our colleagues who are joining this amazing profession, this incredible profession that has so much to offer us and our students. And I really appreciate um, even the, the um, intentions around these uh, Monday webinars today, it's a Tuesday webinar, this idea of things being bite-sized. And mm. that was really our intention whenever we created this particular publication. We'll talk a bit from time to time uh, about some of the features that are in there, but we've really made this uh, a very visual guide. Um, uh, bite-sized chunks of of information, lots of visuals to be able to carry the themes and so on. And today during our short time together, uh, what we're going to focus on especially is uh, about creating learning environments where students thrive. And whether you are a first year teacher, hello, Chloe, um, or you are an experienced teacher, it's a great way to be able to kind of revisit some really core ideas. Our success criteria, <clears throat> pardon me, our success criteria for this time together include uh, a continuum of engagement. Let's talk about what engagement means and looks like. Um, uh, clarity in the classroom, really a fundamental concept that holds together ideas. And being able to check for understanding, knowing that uh, students are either uh, on the uptake or whether you need to go back and revisit some of that information. So those are going to be our three big ideas tonight. How do we get engagement happening? How do we increase clarity? And how do we check for understanding to see if we're having an impact? Now, as I as I noted earlier, this uh, publication is a bit different from uh, other publications, Doug, that you and I have done in the sense that uh, it is 
meant to be very visual uh, along the way. We've uh, parsed this out, the book itself out, into six really core ideas uh, around teaching and learning, including creating the climate, the planning and engagement for learning. How do we assess learning? Um, those instructional moves that are so important. And, uh, and we're really excited about tools and strategies that support what that learning looks like. And you'll find features all throughout to be able to help propel to move forward uh, these particular ideas. What you'll find uh, in the book as well, and again, as I said, it, it looks quite a bit different from some of the other publications we've done. Lots of image-driven infographics. All of those features are meant to be in infographic form with uh, myth busters right up there, up front. What are some common misconceptions around that particular idea? And uh, several tools to help move the learning forward, ways to be able to think about elevating your practice. Uh, we've got checklists in there for you to be able to use. We've got videos in there. I'm so excited uh, about the videos that we have. All of uh, teachers at the early end of their career um, uh, really demonstrating what those look like in elementary and secondary classrooms. And then, of course, additional resources to point you to as well. And as I said, our intention really to make this bite-sized chunks of information. And Doug, I know you're going to talk about one of those bite-sized chunks, which is around engagement. Yeah, and we've been talking about engagement a lot. And I'll tell you, when students engage in a lesson, it is super reinforcing for the teacher. We feel good. And we need our new folks to say, yes, I can do this. I can engage learners in meaningful learning experiences because it reinforces us. It feels makes us feel good, it makes us recognize that we chose the right profession. Now, when you look at research summaries on engagement, they talk about these three dimensions of engagement. There is behavioral engagement, and I put some examples of what behavioral engagement might look like. <clears throat> there is cognitive engagement. Sometimes when coaches and administrators come in a classroom, they say students were not engaged. It's all behavioral, <clears throat> but it's also cognitive. We want to not just look at their behaviors, but get in their minds. Um, also around emotional engagement and the levels of comfort in that classroom. <clears throat> now, researchers talk about this but they get kind of mixed up and they, they overlap one another and they've been hard to implement or operationalize in the classroom. <clears throat> but then along comes Amy Berry. And Amy Berry is an Australian researcher and <clears throat> she did a study on teachers' perceptions around engagement. And she argues that it occurs in these six uh, dimensions of a, of a continuum <clears throat> from disrupting on one end to driving on the other end. And when we saw this, we started saying we could teach students about engagement. We could teach students the difference between the behaviors, cognitive, emotional, um, you, know, you know, behavioral. How do we think about avoiding learning versus participating in learning? The engagement side versus the disengagement side. Interestingly, in the middle, it's passive and it goes active in both directions. Students can be actively engaged or actively disengaged. <clears throat> so I'll show you an example of what a teacher did. What a teacher did is say, with her class, what does it look like when, our, when we're engaged? And so you can see the comments here, <clears throat> throwing objects, tapping shoulders, tapping someone's shoulder, making off topic announcements. This is a whole bunch of things that the students in this class said, this is what disrupting looks like in our classroom. This is what avoiding looks like in our classroom. And Zadie says, for example, I avoided, I asked to go to the nurse when I don't have anything wrong with me. <clears throat> withdrawing. In our classroom, this is what withdrawing looks like. In our classroom, this is what participating looks like. What is so interesting is that students can instantly define these six categories. And we've done this in hundreds of classes with students, their teachers. And helping teachers say, as a learning community, whether you're in high school, whether you're in elementary school, this is what it looks like. Now, I will say there's one a kindergarten teacher who created a visual version 
and laminated on students' desks and gave them little poker chips to move around about where they were on. Our YouTube channel, Nancy, could you put our YouTube channel in the chat? So our YouTube channel has more examples of different grade levels of teachers teaching this. In back to Sarah's classroom, this is what it looks like in our class when we're investing in our learning. And this is what it looks like when we're driving our learning. And every day, students set their intention. Where do you intend to be today? This is not a shame wall. This is an engagement intention wall. Where is it you intend to be? And in this classroom, teacher, the teacher asks students to reflect on their level of engagement about three times during the class, and they check in. But I want you to hear directly from a student talking about the continuum of engagement. Now, at this school, <clears throat> this continuum is everywhere. Every classroom, hallways, principal's office, library, cafeteria, everywhere. But listen to this student talk about engagement. My name is Dominic, and I'm, I'm a fourth grade, and I'm in heading school. There are levels of engagement in our classroom. It goes from the stuff of learning with John, participating, investing, and driving. Driving is the best, disrupting is the worst. In our classroom, we, we assess our levels of engagement, and and then, and then we set goals on which level we want to get to and how we are going to do it. So where are you right now in the level of engagement? And in this area, I used to be right here, but um over the past few weeks, I started going from participating to so I'm in this ring with one of my worst days. Like one of my worst days of the week when I'm like not concentrated, I could be out with John, but when I'm feeling good and like I'm focused on that on on that guy. So how did you get how did you do that? I, 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 um, I did more about seeking, I seek, I seek your feedback in the weeks that I got to guiding. So now I'm mostly at either investing in driving. Yeah. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you all for those reactions as you listen to this learner talk about engagement. These are the decisions I make in class. And on my worst day, I'm here. On my best day, I'm here. And this is how I do it. And yes, uh, Emily, as Emily said, ownership in a learning. I set goals. I seek feedback. I am very aware. I am self-regulating. But you know what? Someone had to teach him that. Someone had to give Dominic a tool. What is a tool? And I'll tell you, when I talked to Dominic's teacher, he had a bunch of challenges. He had problematic behavior that was that he was trying to figure out, like, how do I behave in this class? And it's and we've watched this so many times. <clears throat> Students have to become aware. Where do I want to be on this continuum? What's my intention and reflection? It's not going to fix it immediately. But I'll go back to, I'll show you another version of the continuum. All right, so today guys, we're gonna talk about levels of engagement. Levels of engagement is Oops. doing when you're sitting in class, how you're acting. This is a continuum. So what that means is you can move from left to right and back, depending on the day. My name is Maggie Fallon. I'm the ninth grade math teacher at Health Sciences High in Middle College. I use levels of engagement in my classroom to show students where they're at on a daily basis. What do you think avoiding would look like? Catherine? I think avoiding is like sleeping in class, asking to go to the bathroom a lot. And so when you're doing those things, what are you avoiding? Paying attention in class and doing your work. Perfect. Yes, yeah. you're looking for ways to not do your work. What do you guys think? What does withdrawing look like in a classroom? Carolina, what do you think? Withdrawing probably using your phone and like just like not participating. Absolutely, yeah. Now we're moving from that left all the way to the right, participating. What does participating look like in a classroom? Jose? It's when you stay on task and pay attention. And are you talking and asking questions? Only if it's in task. So it's definitely on task behavior. You're doing work, you're paying attention. The last one is driving. Jorge? I think driving would be like like setting goals and like 
wanting to know what you want to do. Amazing. Driving is how can I maybe like further my learning outside of the classroom or how can I? So the team decided to use this strategy because I think it's really important for students to be aware of where they're at. And then also for us digging deeper as to like, what's the reason behind where you're at and how can we change it from withdrawing into participating? Where do you think you're going to be at for today's lesson? Selena, what do you think? Where are you going to be at today? Um, I think participating or investing on that is pretty good. Why do you think that? Because I've been understanding the work in the lessons, and I don't think that I'm at driving yet. Jorge, how are you feeling? Um, withdrawing because I've been, like, sleeping. I've been too tired. I haven't really been paying attention. Uh, so you're feeling like you might be avoiding or withdrawing. With the support of your, your table mate, you could possibly get to participating and writing down some answers and answering some questions. If we can have students be more aware, we start having those conversations, kind of change it from like, okay, I know that you're not in a good headspace today, but how can we use the levels of engagement to change that mentality from a negative to a positive? It's really important for you as a learner to say, okay, I want to do better. You guys have to take on that responsibility of, I want to be invested in my learning. I want to drive my own learning. Okay. And that can only help you in your future. And we've seen this in so many different classrooms. Uh, I did it with uh, School for the Deaf uh, in another state. I've done this with students with more significant disabilities, creating picture communication symbols mm -hmm. of where we want to be. There's all kinds of ways to do this. What I think about, though, is did we actually teach engagement or do we simply expect students to engage? And there is a difference. And so if we get to take the responsibility and generate it with the class, then when students for a long term saying, are you living up to where your intention is? And I wanted to go to show you this, a little bit updated version. Here's a version of a class check-in. Where are you, you know, electronically? Um, where are you with this? Here's an updated version. Notice that the second row is your engagement with peers, not just your engagement individually. But when we ask you to work with someone else, what is it looking like? And then the third row is what the goals of the teacher. What would your goal be? Because not every lesson requires the whole time to be driving. Sometimes, quite frankly, you're super happy when students do what you ask them to do. Pay attention and do the work. And then maybe a half an hour later, 10 minutes later, you want them to move to investing. <clears throat> but I want to say this for those of you who have kids who are disrupting right now. If you can move a student from disrupting to avoiding, the kid is going to learn more and take it as the win. Because you can't expect a learner who's going disrupting the learning all the way over to investing and driving. Take the win. The kid's not distracting others and disrupting the learning environment. So they're a little off task. It's better than the day before. And then maybe in the next couple of days, you can move them to withdrawing. You can do that. You can sit there, behave, and daydream a little bit. It's still progress. And the kid's going to learn a little bit more. And once they're withdrawing, maybe you can get them to do a little bit of work. But if we don't internalize and say, you know what? The kid was here and I moved a level over. That's me. I was effective. We're holding too high of expectations when we say that kid's currently disrupting for valid and not valid reasons. Some kids have things happening in their lives and they're going to avoid learning. And I would too if those things happened to me. But our job is to move them one over and then one over and then one over and be take it as the success. So our first message is let's teach engagement. Let's have students set their level of engagement and help them understand over several lessons what it feels like to move into investing and driving. That second big idea, um, so first of all, um, really building the self-regulation skills of students, uh, being able to use communication on a regular basis to be able to talk about engagement, so important. The second big idea that we wanted to talk about today was about planning for learning. Um, this is a huge task, certainly a big task, uh, even for experienced teachers, but it can be an enormous task, maybe even sometimes an overwhelming task for uh, somebody who is new to the profession or perhaps new to the grade level or the content as well. And a core idea 
is around this idea of teacher clarity. This is such a deeply researched uh, area of teaching, and it's all about the alignment. Uh, in other words, uh, aligning what your practices are, and from a student-facing side, that we are clear as teachers about making sure that we are conveying quite intentionally to students, here's what we're learning about today. Um, and here's why this is important. And here's how you're going to know and I'm going to know that you learned it. I know when I began in my teacher preparation program so long ago, we had objectives, right? We were supposed to put our objectives in and so that it would organize our thinking. But it literally never occurred to any of us that we should share those objectives with our students, right? And it's to me, it's just like when you get in your car and you're going to be driving to a destination. If you know what your destination is and you put it in your GPS, you're probably going to get there a lot more efficiently. And you're going to have more confidence in being able to get there because you've got that turn by turn guidance uh, along the way. Uh, Doug showed you one of the videos um, uh, that we have in. Included in the book, those short welcome to teaching uh, videos as well. Let's take a look um, at some other teachers, different teachers um, uh, in this particular case uh, from Emily Brokaw's uh, neighborhood in Dallas, Texas. Oh, oh yes. Merida. Today, I am learning to create a 3D origami sculpture. All right, mail it down. Okay, and then how do we know that we learn our objective? How do we do that? Hmm. Let's see here. Let's get Afne. How do we know that? We look at our yeah, can you say all the louder? Success criteria. Yeah, and who can read some of our success criteria? Let's see. Let's do Joseph, Suleyla, and Serenity. I can identify TV shapes. Okay, next one. And? All right. So there are some key words here that I want you guys to focus. Identify. Okay. Compare and fold. These are the things that we're going to do today so that we know that we have learned how to create a 3D sculpture, right? Now, let's see if we um, know really what that means. So I want you to grab your boards, grab your, uh, your white board marker, and I want you to write a lesson objective in your own words. What does this mean to you that we're going to learn to create a 3D origami sculpture. Let's do a minute, Joseph. All right, I like that um, Allison is, I like how Allison is writing her sentence with a compose with a capital letter. Thank you, friend. Okay. All right, how much time do you got, Joseph? All right. Good job, friend. Oh, I like how Daniel even ha even has a picture to go with his sentence. If you got a check mark, can you please stand up? All right. Can you share, Daniel, what you wrote, and can you show your class what you wrote and what you drew? Yeah, I'm going to make uh, origami. All right. And can you show? Tell them about your picture. Uh, 
Uh, two D uh, six into three D. All right. Can you show your class? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sir. And then Amrani. Can you show your class? All right. Forms. Good job. And then Serenity. Okay. Great. Thank you. I love that in the span of uh, less than four minutes, what she's been able to do is to already jumpstart that teaching. She's already done a tremendous amount of instruction and assessment just through that opening activity. What she has accomplished include things like priming them for what it is that they're going to be learning. She's also gotten all of them to be able to utilize the academic language of the lesson in writing, as well as in many cases, being able to use it orally as well. That academic language practice is so important. In the meantime, she's already checking for understanding. In the opening minutes of that lesson, she already is gaining a sense of who knows what. And Leah also mentioned too in the chat that being able to utilize uh, activities where you're not only sharing with them what the learning intentions and the success criteria are, but causing them to consider in, in Leah's case, what it is that they already know about that topic, so powerful to be able to do so. Now, those were younger students uh, that were uh, doing that. We also have uh, an example of older students. And in this particular case, because these are students who are quite accustomed to having success criteria every day, this teacher is leading them in a lesson around them co-constructing success criteria with her. In other words, not just her telling them what the success criteria is, but gaining agreement, consensus about what success looks like. Doug, let's go ahead and take a look at this. And feel free to live chat what you're noticing about Shana and her class. I love the chat going. That's the cool thing about these is we can watch and read at the same time thinking about your own thinking. So today, um, like I had said, we are going to start learning about and talking about, really, I should say, about what it means to kind of take your learning into your own hands and to craft your own learning experience. So before we kind of go into what that's going to look like today, what I would like you to do is brainstorm on your tables for a second. But I want you to just individually think for a second, how do you know that you have learned something? Ooh. I'm starting to see some common trends and common language that you're using to explain how you think you've learned something. So if I can just hear a few voices and maybe we can pop some of those trends out. Helen? I know I've learned something when I can teach it to somebody and I feel calm doing it. Okay, so when you can teach it to somebody and you feel calm doing it. I love that, right? So there's no angst about it. You feel comfortable. You feel strong in what it is that you're doing. Perfect. Thank you. Helen? Um, I can explain the topic of... You can, okay. I can connect to my life. Connect it to your life. Oh, I like that. So relevancy, right, Thurston? I'm also engaged when I'm, when I'm in my conversation, when I'm applying my own learning from, like, learning about this topic or this skill in another class or it's going to learn about it. So you're, you're able to draw from other areas and other aspects of knowledge that you have and be able to put that into what it is you're talking about? Yeah. Nice. Thank you, Thurston. So I want you to leave those ways that you know how to identify learning on your table so that as we're going through this exercise, you are then able to figure out what you think the success criteria should be for this learning intention today. So as you work as a group, you're going to then open that up and explain to me why you think they meet expectations, why you think that article exceeds expectations, or why you think it needs a little bit of revising. For the, like, even when you look at it, it's much longer because it's not going to have much more information than this one. Sources are cited. What do you say? Oh, okay. The clarity is there. So you know exactly what they're talking about. They also, like, 
answer what the entire um, essay or paper is going to be about by telling us like what they're actually going to report on. They don't just immediately jump into it. Um, that's actually like a little bit of punctuation. <laughs> So do you think that in this one, by reading it, you, if I want to tell you what the assignment was, you would be able to know what the assignment is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or do you think this one meets or exceeds? Which one? Uh, we said, yeah, it would meet our interpretation. And I just remembered, like, what you told us, like, you were grading on. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, like some teacher Go off of me. Oh, you yeah. 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 In this class. Me. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good job. Wait, what kind of format? It's not like the spacing is off, right? What else? Grammar is off. Right? So you have all these things labeled somewhere because those are great points to find them. So grammar, you said, spacing. And then what else? Is there anything else missing? Yeah. And you might want to compare it to when you when you find out that one needs revising, you might want to compare it to one that you think needs expectations so that you can see what else this one might be missing. Right? What you have on your tables right now is an example of different types of success criteria that should be included in an assignment that looks like this, right? I'm gonna go around from table to table and I'm gonna ask you for some of your examples. Uh, but number two, we agreed that it exceeded expectations because it had transitional words. It quoted from sites and it had great grammar and language. Thank you. Group three. But it's not in paragraph forms. Right? It, it barely answers the questions and, and um, it needs capitalization, punctuation, and it needs to be written in complete sentences. It could have been broken into more paragraphs. Thank you. Before, there's not a lot of like, reasoning, like for what you're saying. Okay. And then for example one, because it's good for changes, it's really clear. Um, it's thorough and it's organized, but again, it's not complete. Thank you guys. Now that we have those common themes of what we want the success criteria to look like, we're going to decide what the main three are. Could be all of them, could be one, could be two. Um, to me, it's probably proper grammar because it's, it's just important to have it from proper grammar, you, uh, you won't be able to understand you. If you turned in a paper that has great proper grammar, but it doesn't have your citations included and is not in MLA format, if that's what was asked of you, is it at the college level? No. Andrew? Well, we two, three, and four should be included because two and three, if you can get those down, will create number one. Okay. And number four can either make or break your paper and whether or not it's actually college format or not. Does everything you turn in in every class have to be in paragraph form? No. Should everything be in proper, proper grammar? Yeah. Should it all have a flow and strong transition? Should any source you use be cited. Do those show the way to learn how to write at collegiate level? Does the wording of this look like normal success criteria that you've seen? No, right? What is typical success criteria? How is it written? I can statement. Okay, so we've seen I can statement. We can choose to write them as we can statements, or you can choose to write them in rubric format. What do you guys think is the easiest? Use proper grammar? Uh, yeah. OK. What about this one? I can apply. apply. I love that word. Direct flow. Does this make sense? It doesn't make sense, right? Oh, I can practice using with strong, strong transitions. Does that sound good? Yeah. OK. And what about citations? I can what? I can. Mm. I can include citations. So I can include citations and apply them. Yeah. Do you think if you are able to follow these, you would know that you have met the learning intention for the day yes. of writing at a collegiate level? Yes. Very good. Give yourselves a round of applause. Very good. <laughs> One of the notes of appreciation that I have for Shana is that we deliberately did not tell you what content uh, she was teaching. It's a nutrition class, um, but the idea 
that students understand consistently what it is that success looks like across their classes and the fact that those markers of success translate from one content area to the next. Love, love, love that. Now, something that is newer that I sure wish had been around whenever I was uh, new to the profession is around AI. AI has uh, potential to be able to really bolster what it is that teachers are doing, new teachers as well as experienced teachers, especially by being able to shape what it is that they are planning on doing. Now, some important caveats for that, the um, uh, whether you're using uh, an engine like ChatGPT or, uh, or a different platform, uh, important to know, you've always got to have the human in the loop. About 80% of uh, what comes across it is usually something useful. Uh, it's all about crafting what your prompt is, but this can give you a leg up. Doug, you're going to kind of talk us through uh, some, uh, some um, uh, experimentation that you did online with looking at planning. Yeah, so this is ChatGPT 3.5. Magic School also works. EduAid works. There's all kinds of platforms out there that do this. <clears throat> so this is my screen. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, and I just want to highlight that we can get a thought partner to help us. And a thought partner can be AI. <clears throat> so as a new teacher, use AI. I wrote, how do I teach about the human heart in 10 days? Develop lesson plans. Now, these lesson plans are not very detailed, but I didn't ask for detail. I could ask. I could go back and forth, gap, back and forth, back and forth. But then instantly it gave me objectives, activities, homework. Um, now, I don't really like the idea of guest speaker. I'm not going to go find a guest speaker and make a guest speaker. I'm not doing that. So I probably could say, hey, I don't like day nine. Revise it. <clears throat> I don't want a guest speaker. But overall, this is useful as my thought partner. Then I said, what would success, critter, <laughs> right, <laughs> for each day look like. And look, instantly I get three success criterion for each of those 10 days. These are useful. As, it, as Nancy said, about 80% of them, we analyzed, we've been reading the research on this, 80% of them work. A whole bunch of them did not work. And on a, I, but I didn't have to think of these. So if I look at day five here, it says the student can interpret a simple ECG. That's way above what I'm teaching. I'm not going to use that as a success criteria. However, the second, the next one down there, students understand the connection between heart sounds and cardiac events. That's useful. And I didn't have to think of it. But I'm a human and my brain says, here are the ones I'm going to use. Here's the ones that I'm going to not use. And as Emily was saying, what a great way to get new teachers to come together. Because then we're not criticizing each other. What we're doing is saying, hey, chat GPT gave me this, Magic School gave me this, um, Eduade gave me this, Bard gave me this, but it's not perfect. But it gives me something to think about as it scrubs the internet. So we wanna figure out AI tools that make the work, the planning side of teaching less difficult so we can spend more time on our relationships with our students. So please use these tools, ask them for the success criteria, ask them for learning intentions, ask them for ideas on lessons, and then use your brain to decide which of them you're going to use. Now, one more con we have a couple more concepts we'd like to share. One of them is on assessment. We could go on for hours on assessment. We are not gonna go on for hours on assessment. We're gonna choose one kind of assessment. One kind of assessment that we hope all of you, brand new or not, are using on a regular basis. These universal responses, these micro assessments that you can use to propel learning forward. This inclusive response where you capture ideas, evidence from your students on a regular basis. A good rule of thumb is to provide a universal response at least every 10 minutes. That can be a physical response. That could be a, uh, a dry erase board. There's all kinds of ways um, 
to get this universal response from students. And you want to check in with your students about every 10 minutes. You could have a choral response. You could use fist to five. You could use Kahoot. There are piles of ways to invite students to respond. And we want to avoid calling on one student at a time back to the teacher, one student back to the teacher, one student back to the teacher. Yes, even nonverbal clues. There are all kinds of ways, but try to set your goal that at least every 10 minutes, you are checking in with all of the students to see what you need to do with the lesson. Now, before I give you examples, I wanna recognize the power of wait time. We, when we give a prompt, a cue, something we want from our students, there is a need to wait and let them process. Now, I'm going to show you a, an infographic from Valentina, our friend. Uh, we have, she does these great visuals. <clears throat> she inspires us. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at her, her visual on wait time. And in the chat, put in, what are you thinking about? What's resonating with you? What's connecting to, to you on Valentina's power of wait time? So which of these statements or comments is uh, translation time? Thank you. The two kinds of waiting, <clears throat> waiting for the answer to come back to you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Courageous. Processing time. It's a powerful tool. Two weights. Love it. <clears throat> Thank you for processing, normalizing wait time. Processing time, not everybody processes in the same way. All of this is super important. And as their teachers though, we have to like grab all the responses from the class and say, what do I need to do next? <laughs> now, response cards have been around a long, a long time. There was a large study done in 2007. There have been studies since then. <clears throat> response cards are associated with higher achievement, higher levels of participation and less problematic behavior than traditional hand raising. And we want universal responses, respond cards. Now you can buy them. You can buy response cards as if from Amazon, <clears throat> they make them easier, but they're a little expensive. So we don't have to buy them, we can make them. So we're gonna show you, uh, they call them participation cards. This is Concourse Village in the Bronx in New York. <clears throat> Every teacher uses these cards. They, Nancy and I were there again in December and Everybody uses them. You'll fa in fact, you'll see some of the video. The, some of them are tattered and worn because they've been used so many times by students. Participation cards are these cards that the students use to be acknowledged, to ask for help when needed, and then to agree and disagree with one another when they're having discussions in the classroom. The pink card, you, it's like I disagree with you, but now if you turn it around and you really need help, and it says I do not know what to do and I don't need help. So when we have a quick check for understanding, they'll flash their cards. So if they all had a consensus, they can agree on why they found the answer and support it. Now, if there isn't a consensus, you'll see some students flashing up, I disagree with you. And then that's where the conversation starts. When they say you need to flash, I'll show you the answers and give me the consensus. And if we get a consensus, we're going to share how we got that answer. Do we agree that it's 83? Or do we disagree? It's not. Mariara, what do you think? It's not. Oh, man, that old experience, Sarah. Soraya? And the text, Miss Miss Fanny said that um, most kids have it um, experience. I think it's important for them to know what a consensus is so they can understand that as a collective, they all got the same correct answer. So that means that they all understood what was happening in the text and they had comprehension. Yes, and thank you for all those chats. <clears throat> and multiple ways. There's technology ways, Padlets, Kahoot, all these different things. 
to collect responses so that we can make adjustments in real time. We might call this short cycle assessment. We're cycling through these assessments rapidly to figure out what do we need to adjust in the lesson to increase the learning from our students. One more bonus idea, a feature that we have in Welcome to Teaching is a section on strategies for learning. I think all of us um, at every point in our career are continually collecting various uh, ways in which uh, we can forward the learning, having that active learning that's going on. We've identified 22 of those high utility research-based uh, activities that can be utilized. There's a whole list of them. I imagine there are lots of familiar ones that are on there. But what we've done is we've paired those with short videos showing how teachers are using that particular approach at different grade levels. Here's one example. This is using exit slips in English. So I'm going to explain this, hand it out to you, fill out this exit ticket, and then you're going to hand it to me as you walk out the door. So today, your exit ticket is pretty simple. First thing, put your name on it, please, because otherwise I'm not going to know who wrote these beautiful notes to me. Um, the first question is, what part are you at in the writing process? So circle one below. If you're in between, you can like write, I'm in between pre-planning, or you can write, I'm at the beginning of my rough draft. But so circle either pre-planning, rough draft, ready for a peer review, or your final draft. So circle one of these, whatever space that you're in, you can like circle in between. Um, you can write a note if you say that you're gonna be ready for your peer review in like by the end of the day or by next period, um, that's perfect. And then the other thing that I need you to write for me is what could you use from me to help you complete your narrative on time? So even if that's just, I need you to remind me um, to stay focused. I need you to read my paragraph three. I need you to check my formatting of my dialogue. Any of those things, write a little note to me and I will make sure to get that done next time I see you. So do we have any questions about this? Sorry, uh, don't forget the time was late. I don't think you should have it now. Oh, you're going to do that Tuesday. Yeah, you take that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So as we come close to the end of our time together, and I love watching your chats. Thank you very much for that and the interaction with that. We end with some notes, um, some comments after our careers for new teachers. <clears throat> And the first is that nothing replaces making sure that students know that you care, uh, that you care when they are having their finest moments, and also that you're there when they are not their best selves. This really is the foundation of everything else that students learn. I've also said, I wish I could write a teacher job description that said, number one, part of your job, develop amazing relationships with students. Number two, Make sure what you teach is relevant. If you can do those two things, if you've got great growth producing relationships with students and they, what they see in class is relevant to them because you've made it relevant, they're going to learn from you. We have to improve the relevance. There are so many young people who say, I don't know why I'm learning this. But we went to college to learn these things and we love our content. Let's make it relevant for our learners. The third is to make sure that we're always explaining 
procedures and processes and expectations. Whether we're talking about what it is that engagement looks like, you know, it's not enough to be able to say, hey, kid, you're in eighth grade, you should know how to behave by now. We've got to teach them about what it is that work looks like in this classroom. And being mindful of the fact that when it comes to new teachers, we need to be careful that we're not throwing around so much jargon and just assume that they know what we're talking about as well. When we're talking about exit slips, let's make sure that we're explaining what exit slips are. The fourth recommendation, as we've reflected, is don't make assumptions about what students know. Don't assess them on things you didn't teach them. Check in with them. You'll be surprised at how many amazing things your students know, and you might find some things they still need to know from you. Don't make the assumptions it's your responsibility to guide their learning. Number five is another really important idea to keep in mind, and, and that's to keep your sense of humor and joy. Um, kids are hilarious, and over your teaching career, you collect so many good stories about things that students say and do. When you have people outside of education that wonder why is it that you do what you do, it's because they bring us joy literally every single day. All of us have chosen to be with young people for a reason. That energy, that humor, that joy is what keeps us moving forward. And number six, connect with your colleagues. Your colleagues want you to be successful. We need you. Connect, stay connected. <clears throat> Enjoy your colleagues. Go to your professional learning community meetings. Go to your team meetings, your grade level meetings. Make Take what you can from colleagues. Most of your colleagues are more than willing to share. <clears throat> they will give you their ideas. Now, I think of this, it's kind of like going to the store and trying on clothes. Some things you try on, they don't fit. Some things you try on, they fit. Some things you look at and you say, that's not me at all. Some things you try on and wear for a while, and then you change it out a year later. That's what this is about. Connect with your colleagues. Listen to their ideas and advice. Take the things that resonate with you that will impact your students. And finally, let's make sure that we're allowing ourselves the grace that we extend to our students every day. It uh, it always amazes me that there are such caring teachers that absolutely deeply understand that learning is a process, that there are mistakes that their students will make, and that that's a part of that. And yet, we have sometimes unrealistic expectations for ourselves, that we somehow need to be perfect the very first time that we try something out. Give yourself the grace that you need. Be reasonable with yourself and understand that if you're really fortunate, you spend an entire career learning and getting better and deepening your understanding year after year. Thank you so much for all it is that you do for young people, for their families and their communities.